In my last video, I discussed the rise and fall of Islands of Adventure's former attraction, Dueling Dragons, a pair of inverted roller coasters unlike anything the world has ever seen. Universal will go on to replace the dragons with a new beast of a roller coaster by the name of Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure, a multi-launching roller coaster manufactured by Intamin Amusement Rides. And if you've seen my full review video on Hagrid's, then you know that I consider the attraction to be a perfect addition to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Even more so, I consider it to be the best ride at the Universal Orlando Resort. Guests climb aboard Hagrid's famous motorbike and take a ride into the Forbidden Forest as they encounter various magical creatures. Overall, I believe the ride combines some of the best elements of a theme park attraction into a single experience. But this combination of elements does have a drawback, and that's the added complexity of the ride. I'm sure many of you heard or witnessed just how unreliable Hagrid's motorbike adventure was during its first several months of operation. And after learning more and more about the ride, I think it's a miracle the coaster was even open as often as it was during its troubling opening months. In this video, we will be analyzing many of the technical aspects of this ride, which might help you appreciate it more than you already do. I honestly think it's one of the most daring roller coasters built since Top Thrill Dragster at Cedar Point in 2003 or King Naka at Six Flags Great Adventure in 2005. Before we get started, if you guys wouldn't mind hitting the like button, that would be greatly appreciated as it helps the channel immensely amongst the YouTube algorithm. Alright, let's dig in. Warning, some viewers may be too lame to enjoy the following information. Dragon Challenge, aka Dueling Dragons, was closed for good on September 4th of 2017, and almost immediately, Universal got to work and demolished the two coasters. Clearly, they were up to something, and they were wasting no time. After the two coasters were fully removed, it was obvious that the park had left the station building for Dueling Dragons still intact. In January of 2018, construction of Hagrid's began, but at the time, the name and the attraction itself were still a mystery, as Islands of Adventure had not officially acknowledged that they were up to anything. As track and support pieces began to arrive on site, it became immediately obvious that the ride was manufactured by Intamin Amusement Rides. The same manufacturer who had built Harry Potter and the Escape from Gringotts in 2014 at Universal Studios Florida. Over the next year, construction crews would continue their work on the attraction, and it wasn't until work was nearly finished that Universal finally announced the attraction on February 21st of 2019. From the mysterious streets of Diagon Alley, to the magical halls of Hogwarts Castle, the world's most spellbinding journey is about to take its wildest turn yet. Prepare to face the Forbidden Forest and join Hagrid to encounter the rarest of magical creatures in the epic new addition to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Only at Universal Orlando Resort. The ride would be named Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure. Quite the long name. And for the first time ever, riders could fly deep into the wilds of the Forbidden Forest, beyond the grounds of Hogwarts Castle, and much more. It was announced the ride would officially open on June 13th of 2019, and naturally, hype surrounding the roller coaster continued to grow. After construction had finished, the ride began testing readily throughout the spring season, and all seemed to be going well. Train after train would cycle the course with what seemed like no hesitation. And as planned, in June of 2019, the ride underwent its media day, as well as opening day kickoff. And although the ride was immediately met with large fanfare, it was embarrassingly obvious how unreliable the coaster was. It was common for Hagrid's to spend hours upon hours closed at a time, with only a few minutes of operation in between shutdowns. And this was not helpful for the absolutely massive crowds the coaster attracted either. On opening day, the line for the coaster stretched all the way back to nearly the park entrance. Some guests would spend all day in line, just to be denied a ride. Because of all the downtime, Universal began opening the attraction later in the day instead of at park opening, as they addressed operational issues with the coaster. The park would update guests through their phone app as to when the coaster officially opened for the day, and it was overall a mess. Some days, Hagrid's Motorbike Adventure would unfortunately remain closed all day. Universal would later move to opening the coaster with the park every day, but closing the attraction early instead of at park close, to allow time for engineers to continue addressing issues. But even when the coaster was open, operations were sporadic, and it was common for the coaster to reopen only to quickly close back down for technical issues. The coaster quickly gained a reputation for being one of the most unreliable roller coasters ever built, and also one of the hardest attractions to ride. Although I should point out that the coaster was not unsafe at all, it was very safe, just operationally a headache. On my last visit to the Universal Orlando Resort in July of 2019, the only way I got to ride the coaster was with a skip the line pass. And even with that pass, it took me well over an hour to get on the ride, 
thanks to several technical delays. Now the roller coasters at Disney or Universal theme parks are more often than not very different than the roller coasters you'd find at a run of the mill Six Flags park. For one, the rides usually feature an abundant amount of theming, and two, the rides are built to run at a far higher capacity, which means that they are able to account for more riders every hour, and to do so regularly. Next door to Islands of Adventure at Universal Studios Florida is Hollywood Rip Ride Rocket, a major outdoor roller coaster. The ride is built to handle a monstrous number of guests each hour, and it does so with small 12 passenger trains similar to the small 14 passenger trains found on Hagrid's motorbike adventure. In order for roller coasters like these to feature such high rider capacities, they must be able to cycle well over 100 trains every hour. On Rip Ride Rocket, this is made possible by the high number of brake runs found throughout the ride that divide the track into multiple block sections, allowing for several trains to be safely on the layout at the same time. And the same idea applies to Hagrid's motorbike adventure. Hagrid's is also divided into several different block zones, allowing several trains to safely be on the course of at the same time. Now for those of you who are unfamiliar, a block zone is a section of ride that only one train may occupy. At the end of a block zone is a method to stop a train in case the block zone ahead is still occupied. This is the safety system that prevents roller coaster trains from colliding with one another. But the way the two coasters execute their block zones is completely different. Rip Ride Rocket does so more in the traditional sense, meaning the ride features one large lift hill and then the rest of the layout relies on gravity. Each block zone is gravity fed as the train descends through the course and gradually burns off speed until the ending hills are very small. Whereas Hagrid's Motorbike Adventure is a multi-launching roller coaster that instead relies on a series of launches, special elements, and even moving track pieces to carry the trains from block zone to block zone. This in turn leads to a large amount of additional technical components featured on Hagrid's that are not found on Rip Ride Rocket. Since Hagrid's Motorbike Adventure spends most of its time at ground level, it features seven different launches powered by Linear Synchronous Motors, or LSMs, to keep trains rolling around the 5,053 feet or 1,540 meters of track. At the moment, the ride's manufacturer Intamin advertises their LSM launching roller coasters to use fifth generational LSM technology. The LSM stators used by Intamin are produced by a company named Innovative Drive Technologies, or InDrive Tech for short. While I wouldn't say the LSM stators are unreliable, having seven launches means that there are more opportunities for launch errors like rollbacks or other minor issues. It's common for other Intamin multi-launching roller coasters like Maverick at Cedar Point or Tehran at Fantasialand to feature two launches. Some even feature three, like Cheetah Hunt at Busch Gardens Tampa, but Hagrid's features a whopping seven of them. So the more launches you have, the more opportunities for downtime. And each launch section also features adjustable magnetic brake fins, which are moving parts. The brake fins help slow down a train if it doesn't launch fast enough and rolls backward into the launch track. Each brake fin must lower out of the way of a moving train for each launch. Then after the train launches, the brake fin must raise back into the braking position in case the train rolls backward. To monitor the position of the brake fins, sensors are positioned on each fin mechanism. If just one fin were to throw a minor error, it's possible that the computer will shut down the entire ride. This is the same issue that plague intimate hydraulic launching roller coasters like Top Girl Dragster or King Naka. These rides rely on a massive number of adjustable brake fins that also feature similar sensors. It's possible for the fins to either get stuck or for the sensors to malfunction and register incorrect positions. Either situation leads to a technical delay mandated by the ride's computer system. Hagrid's is also unlike most roller coasters in that the track is not a continuous circuit. On most roller coasters, once your train dispatches from the station, it travels along a continuous section of track until it arrives in the station again. So picture the track as a circle. Well, Hagrid's actually travels over several different individual portions of track. Once you leave the station, you start by traveling a continuous section of track that heads through two launches, inside Hagrid's hut, and then through another two launches. Well, after the fourth launch, the ride passes over what is called a switch track. The switch track is used to pass the train from one continuous track segment into another, and it slides back and forth to align with different track segments. After a fifth launch, the ride hits a 70 degree spike where the train runs out of speed completely and then rolls backward. Most roller coasters are designed to not roll backward, but on Hagrid's, that was just designed straight into the ride because why not? The train continues backwards and rides through the switch track again, but this time passes into a third segment of track. The train continues backward through this third section of track as it heads inside a building. Then inside the building, the train rides over another switch track that aligns the ride for yet another special effect, a drop track. This track segment actually vertically free falls just like a drop tower attraction. And Hagrid's doesn't just feature one drop track, but two of them. 
The two drop tracks are parallel to each other, and by having two drop tracks, the ride is able to cycle more trains every hour to help boost rider capacity. But each drop track is yet another track segment, and also a moving piece of track. So we're now up to five different segments of track since the train has left the station. Although it should be noted that any train will only travel over four different segments of track because the train uses one of two drop tracks. So going back to the start of the drop track, a switch track must properly align in place to pass trains between the two drop tracks. So a moving piece of track must pass trains into yet another moving piece of track, the drop track. Finally, the train exits the drop track and passes over another switch track that places the train onto the same segment of track it started on. We finally have a continuous circuit. So for probably 99.9% .9 of roller coasters, a train simply needs to roll across a continuous circuit of track. But on the other hand, Hagrid's features five different sections of track and relies on moving track pieces for the train to go from point A to point B. So instead of Hagrid's being a simple circle, it's like a mixture of half circles and different lines connected by moving track pieces. It's bizarre. Now Hagrid's is certainly not the first roller coaster to feature switch tracks mid-ride. The earliest switch tracks I know of were found on Togo's Ultra Twister models that feature a large switch track mid-ride. Trains would enter in the forward position and then leave traveling backwards. Another good example is Expedition Everest at Disney's Animal Kingdom. Now on both of these rides, the train stops motion entirely while the track switches position. But on Hagrid's Motorbike Adventure, the ride's first switch track changes places while the train is still in motion. And actually, the train is actually heading directly at it. This is made possible with a high-speed switch track. The switch track is able to change positions rapidly unlike the slower switch tracks found on Expedition Everest or Ultra Twister. Because of this, Trains on Hagrid don't need to come to a full stop while the switch track shifts positions. The ride also relies on a set of LSM stators, brake fins, and tire drives as a failsafe in case the switch track were to not position correctly. If the switch track were to fail to change positions, the LSM stators, brake fins, and tire drives would safely stop the train before it reached the switch track, and the train bottoms out in the little dip leading into the spike. Now what just blows my mind is how Hagrid's relies on these moving track segments for continuous motion. This adds a crazy amount of additional complexity to an already complex ride. The track pieces must move from one position to the next, align themselves properly into the correct position, and then also lock into place hundreds of times every hour. Now let's discuss the station area. Hagrid's features one of the coolest roller coaster stations I've ever seen. The station area is divided into a separate load and unload area, but the entire station platform is always in motion. Trains slowly roll through the unload platform for guests to disembark the attraction, and then over to the load platform for new guests to board. At any time, up to four trains could be inside the station, with say one train at the unload portion, one train in between the unload and load station at what's called the buffer, and two trains on the load portion, and possibly a fifth train entering the station area and a sixth train shortly behind it. These trains all move together at a continuous speed and must maintain an exact distance between each other. The ride uses a bus bar and encoder to monitor the position of each train as it slowly rolls through the station area. The bus bar is the green rail that begins nearby the unicorn on the final brake run. The encoder and bus bar measure each train's position literally to the millimeter and ensure that trains maintain a specific amount of distance between themselves at all times. If trains fail to maintain the necessary distance, the ride can fault and shut down. The continuous motion is done through the use of dozens and dozens of tire drive motors found throughout the station. These tire drives keep the trains at a constant speed as they rub against the bottom of the trains as they push them through the station. An error in any of these drive motors could fault the ride and lead to a delay in operations. And as I said before, there are dozens and dozens of more tire drives found throughout the ride that could also lead to the same issue. The station areas also feature moving platforms for guests and ride hosts. There is one moving platform at the unload station and one moving platform at the load station. These moving platforms must maintain the exact same speed as the moving trains or else the ride faults and shuts down as well. The platform can be thrown off by a large rider who jumps onto the platform which can cause the platform to shift speed slightly, leading to an error. The station is also used to charge the batteries found on Hagrid's trains. These batteries power the lights and speakers of the vehicles during your journey. As the train enters the unload station, it connects with another green bus bar on the right side of the track that charges the battery as the train slowly rolls through the station area. Now these aren't technically batteries, but capacitors actually. Capacitors are different from batteries in how they store energy. Because of the different energy storage method, they can be charged far faster than batteries, but they do not hold as much of a charge. As the train rolls through the station, I hear the capacitors are given enough energy to power a train's special effects for only 10 or 15 minutes. 
So say if the ride experiences a mechanical delay and your train stops mid-ride, if the delay is long enough, you may complete the rest of the ride without any sound effects or lights on your vehicle. When this happens, your train's capacitor simply ran out of juice. So if you haven't noticed by now, Hagrid's features a lot of technical components. Each component must be in perfect working order or the ride can fall and be forced to safely shut down by the computer system. And add to the complexity, the ride can cycle with up to 12 trains on the track at a time. This means that the ride is using these technical components over and over and over again, and also at the same time, as different trains pass over different portions of the track. So say as one high-speed switch track is sliding into place, drop A could be falling, while drop B is rising back into place. Three trains could be simultaneously launching on different launches as different brake fins and tire drives are activating, and on top of that, several trains will be slowly advancing through the stationary at a constant speed as the computer tracks their location down to the millimeter. So it's a lot of non-stop action all at once, and there isn't a single train that ever stops like on a traditional roller coaster. Even on a normal roller coaster that runs three trains, usually one or two of them are stopped at a time, either in the load station or on the brake run directly before the station. But on Hagrid's, all trains in operation are constantly in motion. As I mentioned earlier, all the simultaneous motion between the trains is made possible through a large number of block zones placed throughout the ride. In order to run up to 12 trains at a time, Hagrid's features a rich system of block zones. Pictured here is the block zone diagram for the ride. The block zones are as follows. Mini Boost. Launch 1. Brake Zone 1. Launch 2, Launch 3, Break Zone 2, Launch 4, Launch 5, Drop Track, Launch 6, Break Zone 6, Waiting 1, and then Waiting 2 in the station area that aren't really block zones, but I'll explain that shortly. After leaving the station, the ride enters the first launch, which is called Mini Boost. Just a random fact. While the park's marketing department considers this section a launch, the ride actually doesn't and just considers it a mini boost hence the name of the block zone. And because of this, the ride only considers that there are six launches, not seven. After mini boost, the ride continues into launch one, which you may have thought was launch two. This launch runs parallel to the ride's unload station. This block continues into the next block zone, which is break zone one. This is the break run directly before Hagrid's hut. The next block starts inside Hagrid's hut and is part of the launch two block. Launch two consists of Hagrid's hut, the actual launch two, and all the track leading into launch three. Launch 3 begins the next block zone and continues up and around into break zone 2, which is where riders encounter Fluffy. The ride then passes over the first high-speed switch track, which places the ride into the Launch 4 block. Launch 4 features the 70-degree spike, which reverses the train into the backward direction. The train then passes over the same switch track and backwards into Launch 5. Launch 5 accelerates the train up and through a helix into the drop track building. The Launch 5 block zone ends with the brake run at the top of the helix. Next is the drop track block, which can actually hold two trains, thanks to the two parallel drop tracks. Following the drop track block is the launch 6 block, which features the final and fastest launch of the ride, a whopping 50 miles per hour, or 80 kilometers per hour. This block continues into the next block, break zone 6, which is the first portion of final brake run that brings the train to a near stop. Following break zone 6 is the waiting 1 block, which leads up into the unicorn. Following is the waiting 2 and station area, quote unquote, block zones. I say quote unquote because they aren't really block zones. These are part of the ride's continuous moving areas. Waiting 2 is used to position trains correctly with the other trains as it transitions into the continuous moving pattern, and then the trains continue through the station area at that constant speed in the same position. But two trains can simultaneously be in Waiting 2 at the same time, and up to four trains can be in the station area at the same time. In a traditional block zone, only one train may occupy a block, but these areas are still made safe by the encoder that monitors train locations at all times. And if a station stop is called, all the trains in continuous motion will stop at the same time. And once motion is restarted, the trains will continue motion simultaneously. Altogether, these block zones allow Hagrid's Motorbike Adventure to operate with a theoretical maximum capacity of 1,848 riders per hour. This means 132 cycles per hour and a dispatch about every 27.3 seconds. And this can only occur if the ride is operating all 12 trains. During the ride's design phase, it was thought that the maximum capacity would be just over 2,000 riders per hour. This would mean 143 cycles per hour and a dispatch about every 25.2 seconds. But once the ride began operating, it was determined that 2,000 riders per hour wasn't quite possible. As a ride operations nerd, this makes me laugh because it falls in line with other Intamins with overpromised capacity figures, like Maverick at Cedar Point, which Intamin claimed would have a theoretical capacity of 1,200 riders per hour and is actually capable of 936, or Top Girl Dragster 
which Intamin claimed would do 1,500 riders per hour with 16 passenger trains. And even with larger 18 passenger trains that it runs today, the ride can only do 1,080 riders an hour at most. But luckily, 1,848 riders per hour is very good. The only problem is that it's only possible with all 12 trains in operation, and it's really hard to run all 12 trains. It is actually never operated with all 12 trains while open to guests. In fact, getting the ride to run more than 6 trains at a time was a struggle. When Hagrid's first opened in June of 2019, it could only run up to 6 trains at a time with an hourly capacity of about 620 riders per hour. This was due to several reasons, but basically if more trains were placed on the track, the ride would fault and shut down to the point where it was unusable. And even with just six trains, the ride would still fall and shut down anyway. From what I hear, Universal began the process of reprogramming Hagrid nearly every night to make adjustments to the ride to improve reliability, as well as make it possible to run more trains. This involved cycling the ride for hours while programmers made their tweaks. Over time, Universal slowly worked the ride up to 10 train operations and even took advantage of the shutdown time during the pandemic to continue to make refinements. From what I hear, the work paid off and the ride is capable of reliably running up to 10 trains. Prior to the park shutdown due to the pandemic, it was common for the ride to do up to 1600 riders per hour while running 10 trains, which is very good. But the reason why the ride hasn't run all 12 trains yet is for a few reasons. One is that at the moment, the park doesn't see how 12 train operations with guests is possible. With 12 train operations, the track becomes rather congested with moving trains. In order to maintain the motion of all 12 trains, there can't be any delays with dispatching trains from the station. A train must continue to dispatch from the station about every 27.3 seconds so that trains in the continuous moving area will advance far enough forward to allow the next train to enter the area as well. Say if the continuous motion in the station is stopped due to a large rider who isn't able to fit on the attraction, trains in the station and waiting area 2 block zones will stop advancing forward. This is called a station stop, and it stops all motion simultaneously. But trains moving on the actual ride course will continue motion. Very quickly, the next train approaching the stop trains will be forced to stop as well on the final brake run. Then the next train approaching behind that train will be forced to stop as well on brake zone 6. Quickly, the ride runs out of available space on the final brake run as the station area and brake run aren't long enough to hold all 12 trains. Because of this, trains traveling on the course are forced to stop in various block zones along the ride, like on the drop tracks, the brake run before the drop track, at the reverse spike, and possibly more. Once a train is forced to stop outside of brake zone 6, or the final brake run, the ride has now cascaded. A cascade is where trains traveling around the ride circuit are forced to stop in the nearest control point because the block zones ahead have become backed up. A control point is a part of a block zone that can actually stop a train. So when the ride cascades, picture a bad traffic jam. But for guests riding the coaster, this can have a diminishing effect on the overall ride experience. The ride is designed to function as a continuous experience, meaning trains are supposed to maintain motion until the final brake run. A pause to motion mid-ride will leave an awkward pause in the storyline, which diminishes the experience while riders silently wait for the experience to continue. Additionally, some guests may become frightened over the ride stopping mid-ride and may feel unsafe or threatened by it. While cascading is perfectly safe and proves that block zones are operating correctly, many guests who do not know how the ride actually functions will fear that something wrong is occurring, which is something Universal definitely works to avoid as they want their guests to always feel safe. Now with Hagrid's being a new attraction, a cascade is not as big of a deal as say on a ride like Big Thunder Mountain Railroad at Walt Disney World, which can be forced to shut down if trains cascade or stack mid-ride for more than a few minutes. Hagrid's computer will allow the ride to restart no problem once motion is allowed again in the station, as long as there's no fault or technical issue in the way. So stop trains will begin motion automatically once the block zone ahead clears. But one issue with restarting motion after a cascade is it's very easy to cause a second cascade. With 12 train operations, a cascade can cause trains to stop mid-ride deep into the course. As the station begins motion again and starts pumping out trains, the stop trains on the course cannot resume motion until the block zone ahead clears. So one by one, trains begin motion as the block zones open up. This means the last train to start rolling again will be furthest from the final brake run, but also closest to the next approaching train that was just dispatched from the station. It's possible for the train approaching the stop train to catch up to it and cause a second cascade as it's forced to stop mid-ride because the block zone ahead is still occupied. As a result, ride hosts must play a balancing act once restarting the ride after a cascade, where they either dispatch trains at half speed or stop motion when necessary to allow the stop trains on the course to begin motion first. Cascading can occur once 8 or more trains are placed on the track, but the less trains on the track, the easier it is to restart motion after a cascade occurs. With all 12 trains on the track, 
cascades become more likely to happen and are also harder to recover from. The situation is also similar with 11 train operations. Trains remain very tight with each other and there's also little room for error as well. So the park has determined that as the ride currently stands, 10 trains is the perfect number to operate on the ride as it offers the best balance between reliability, ridership numbers, and also customer service. Apparently with 11 or 12 train operations, while this does guarantee higher rider numbers, the ride crew essentially has to rush guests on and off the attraction to ensure every train dispatches on time. This can lead to rather unfriendly interactions between ride hosts and guests as the platform can get pretty intense. With 10 train operations, while ride hosts still need to rush guests on and off, they do not need to do so very aggressively, so guests are more likely to not get ticked off by a stern ride host. In order to make 12 train operations an actual possibility, further refinement and tweaking to the ride's programming is still necessary. I hear that 12 trains have only been put on the track once while the ride operated in a maintenance mode of operations. But because the park hasn't seen 12 train operations as a viable option yet, I hear the tweaking has been put on hold, and at the time of recording, focus has been put on ensuring 10 train operations stay reliable. Now let's look back to the two drop tracks found on Hagrid's. When riding through the drop track, drop A is on the right and drop B is on the left. These two drop tracks are vital to the ride's capacity. In fact, if one of the two drop tracks are out of order, the ride can only run six trains at most. To add a seventh train or more to the track requires two functioning drop tracks. This is because the drop tracks themselves require a certain amount of time to fall and then reset to accept the next train. If too many trains approach a single operating drop track, the ride will cascade. So if the ride is only running with one drop track and six trains, the continuous motion of the station and moving belts are actually slowed down to about half speed. This means trains dispatch from the station about half as often as when the motion is at full speed. The drop tracks are actually one of the reasons the ride can only run six trains when it first opened in June of 2019, because only one drop track was available to operate. Now with all the problems Hagrid's has had since opening, it kind of begs the question, did the ride open too early? And it turns out the answer is a simple yes. When Universal announced the ride's opening date back in February of 2019, that was based on construction progress with the ride. Up until that point, progress had been exceptional. The opening date was set to June 13th of 2019 because of the ride's progress and also for another reason. In the Harry Potter universe, June 13th of 1943 marks the date that Tom Riddle, aka Voldemort, opens the Chamber of Secrets and kills Myrtle Warren in the process, aka Moaning Myrtle. Rubius Hagrid, the character the ride is themed around, was framed for the attacks by Riddle and got expelled from Hogwarts as a result. Tom Riddle will go on to transform his diary into his first Horcrux. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, you should at least go watch the Harry Potter movies or read the books if you want to know it all. So this date marks an extremely important anniversary in the Harry Potter universe, and Universal, or some other important executive, wanted the ride to open on that date. As the scheduled opening date approached, Universal knew that the ride was not actually ready to open. Further tweaking and refinement were needed to make the ride more reliable while operating several trains in the track. But with the opening date set months in advance, thousands and thousands of guests had already booked vacations around that date, so not opening the ride would have led to a massive amount of disappointment. Executives basically forced that the ride open in order to make sure that these thousands of guests weren't disappointed and also to honor the anniversary date. Now it should be mentioned that opening the ride early wasn't unsafe if you're thinking that. The ride was able to operate safely, but just not reliably. This is what led to the massive amount of downtime the ride faced during its first several months of operation. Luckily, reliability has improved greatly, and I now hear that the ride spends 97% of its time operating. Most of the ride's downtime nowadays is due to weather or guest issues that delay operations. This is far better than the amount of time the ride spent closed in the past, which I would guess was closer to 40% of the time. It's hard to say what decision made more sense, but maybe delaying the attraction's opening date to ensure the ride operated more reliably would have been better for the guest experience, as trying to ride the unreliable attraction was extremely difficult. Better yet, maybe the ride's official opening date should not have been announced as early as it was, and Universal should have waited to announce that. Now problems aside, Hagrid's Motorbike Adventure is one of the smartest roller coasters ever built. It's so smart that it practically runs itself. Without going into much detail, it's almost like the ride is completely autonomous. And instead of the ride relying on buttons to give ride hosts control of the attraction, it relies primarily on RFID technology, or radio frequency identification. For example, as you load into the trains on Hagrid, a ride host comes by to check that your restraints are locked and in the proper position. Once their check of your row is complete, they tap an RFID puck on the left side of the sidecar. This activates the speakers and lights of your row. You'll hear the engine roar to life and the headlights will turn on. In order for a train to dispatch from the station, all seven rows of the train must be activated. 
meaning each row has to be tapped with an RFID puck, and there is no dispatch button either. The computer simply pulls the train into the ride course once it's ready. But it's actually not required that all of the restraints on the ride are closed in a minimum position, so you can actually dispatch trains with the restraints up. And that's because the restraints on Hagrid's do not have a verify. Most modern day roller coasters have a verify position on their restraints, especially if the ride has lap bars. A verify works by measuring the lowest minimum position that a restraint needs to close to in order to be considered safely locked. If all restraints are not in that lowest verify position, the ride's computer does not allow the train to dispatch. This is done through the use of sensors. On Hagrid's, there are markings on the trains and restraints to indicate if lap bars have closed far enough. Ride attendants will check these markings to ensure that restraints are closed far enough for a safe ride. If the restraints are not closed past the markings, riders will not be allowed to ride. On the motorbike, a red line runs down the center shaft of the lap bar. When pulling the lap bar down, this red line must be beyond two black lines on the box that the lap bar shaft extends from. On the sidecar, a line is present on the left side of the car. The lap bar must be able to close beyond this line for the rider to ride. Once a row's restraints are closed beyond the markings, the ride host will tap their RFID puck on the left side of the sidecar, and the row's engines and headlights will fire up. So while the ride doesn't have a physical verify through the use of sensors, it relies on its ride host to be that verify. Once all seven rows of a train have been tagged for dispatch, the computer will continue to advance the train forward into the first curve, and then will automatically dispatch the train into the course. Once trains are on the course, the computer automatically carries all trains in motion through the course and back into the unload station. But if all seven rows of the train are not tagged in time, the computer will auto-stop the station. And just one last fun fact, the dueling that occurs here wasn't intentional. The fact that this duel happens is out of sheer luck. And actually, this duel only takes place when the ride is running at less than full capacity. When running at minimum dispatch times, the train flying out of launch 1 will be ahead of the train on launch 2, more like this. So while Hagrid's motorbike adventure may not be the tallest, fastest, or most thrilling roller coaster, I think it's fair to say that it's one of the most complicated roller coasters out there. Between the moving track sections, 7 launches, potential for 12 train operations, and also the fact that no train ever stops motion, this ride is complex. And while none of these concepts are technically new, Hagrid's takes them all to the extreme. There are plenty of roller coasters that feature one drop track, whereas Hagrid's features two of them. There are plenty of multi-launching roller coasters with two or three launches, whereas Hagrid's has seven of them. There are many roller coasters with one or two switch tracks throughout the ride, whereas Hagrid has three of them, and they were all high-speed switch tracks instead of the old slow ones. The list continues on, and ultimately, Universal and Intamin have a lot of guts for what they built. Not many parks would build a roller coaster with such a risky amount of technology, but I think the effort paid off, and Hagrid's Motorbike Adventure has quickly become one of the most unique roller coasters on the market. Its opening day should have probably just been delayed by a few months, and hopefully one day, we will see reliable and consistent 12 train operations. I know that Universal has not given up on this, and that they would love to see the ride operate as it was intended to. Anyways, I hope you guys found this video enjoyable, and I hope you learned something new. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and turn on the post notification bell so you'll know when I upload my next video. Also, be sure to check out the El Toro Ryan merchandise store if you'd like to support what we do here. The link is in the description. Thank you for watching everyone. Stay safe. Peace.